All right, we're going to talk today about a call to sobriety. Bible word for being serious. We're going to see about that in the dictionary here. Another way to it's written in the scriptures. Um, this actually only appears two times. We'll see those. Another way to say it is sober. And of course, another one that will appear one time in the Bible is soberness. All right. All three of these words only appear in the New Testament. Kind of an interesting thing. But uh, I'm going to read first here in the Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Right there you see it. Uh, the definition of sobriety. Number one, there's uh, four different definitions here. Number one, habitual soberness or temperance in the use of spiritist liquors as when we say a man of sobriety. Okay, it's what modern people would think of mostly with sobriety, not being a drunkard, which is in the scriptures. We will see those verses later. Number two, freedom from intoxication. Again, pertaining to alcohol. Number three, habitual freedom from enthusiasm, inordinate passion or overheated imagination, calmness, coolness, as the sobriety of riper years, the sobriety of age. Number four, seriousness, gravity without sadness or melancholy. Okay. Um, so there you have it. Uh, soberness, freedom from intoxication, temperance. Number two, gravity, seriousness. Uh, number three, freedom from heat and passion, calmness, coolness. Sober, um, I'll just read the, it, they go through the, the thing of not being drunk again, you know, there. But uh, number three, not mad or insane, not wild, visionary, or, over, or, or heated with passion, having the regular exercise of cool, dispassionate reason. Um, number four, regular calm, not under the influence of passion, as sober judgment, a man in his sober senses. Number five, serious, solemn, grave as the sober living livery of autumn. Um, <clears throat> so there you see it, okay? Dictionary definition. You say, well, do you think we really need a call to that? Yes, I do. Because people are not taking situations seriously right now. People are basically acting like the lost world that profess to be Christian. Um, churches today are all about fun and entertainment and whatever else. And if you've gone to church buildings, you know exactly what I mean by that. Um, they're about in, uh, entertaining the people so that you get that money coming in. That's what church buildings are all about. But uh, we're going to read Titus chapter 2. See what the Bible has to say about the issue of being sober. To so turn in your King James Bible to Titus chapter 2. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2. I'm going to read the whole chapter here quickly. It says here, verse 1, But speak thou the things which become sound doctrine. These things that we're supposed to speak, I'm preaching these things to you, and they become sound doctrine. Why? Because you renew your mind through the Scriptures. You experience it with your life as you get older. Remember the sobriety of age? The, you get more serious as time goes by. You know, a lot of the wicked generation now, people that are disobedient to their parents, they say, oh, oh Grandpa and Grandma, they're not any fun. They don't want to do anything fun. Uh, that's the way it should be in terms of, you know, acting like a fool. What most young people consider to be fun now. Um, there should be sobriety there. You should get more serious as time goes on. Um, folks, we live in a fallen world. Oh, oh, what's been better in the past? Well, maybe a little bit, but not much. People have always been wicked. There's always been scheming and fighting and all this other stuff. And as you get older, you realize that. You mature. Okay? These things become sound doctrine. That's why young men shouldn't be preaching and teaching the Word of God in the sense of an elder position. Elder means older. Another way to say it. All right? It's very important to have some experience in life. Why? Well, because then you have relatability. And you can say, hey, let me warn you about those video games. Let me warn you about that alcohol. Let me warn you about that pornography, about that rock music, about the whatever, getting into debt, and name it, name it. I have the experience of many years behind me. I have gray hair for a reason, you know. Verse 2, you say, well, now, come on now. 
Look at the context. Verse 2, that the aged men be sober, grave, serious, temperate, sound in faith, in charity, in patience. Uh, how do you develop patience? By learning how to go through things. So I've been through this before. Just be patient. You know, what do you, you take a child on a trip someplace? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there? This takes a while to get there. It's going to be a couple hour drive. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? <laughs> no, you, you just patience. Be patient. Those are things that you learn with age. Okay. The aged men are supposed to be sober. They're supposed to be serious. They're supposed to look at this world and say, I remember back when I was younger, we went through a similar thing. You know, the old saying goes, the only thing that men learn from history is that men don't learn from history. Um, so many people forget even details of something like September the 11th of 2001. One of the, the most major bad things that happened to America in American history, um, this big terrorist attack thing and whatever else, and yet you say to the average person, what happened to, bu happened to building number seven? They'll say, huh? The North Tower, the South Tower came down, but there was another building at the World Trade Center complex, building number seven, and it came down, and no airplane hit it. Just as an example, they forget. See? An older man that's been through some things, I remember the first Gulf War. I remember the Branch Davidian thing down there. I was in Central America on a mission trip when the whole Branch Davidian thing was going on down in Waco, Texas. Some of you weren't even alive yet when that was going on. That would have been, what, 1993, I think it was? You know, Oklahoma City bombing was 95, I think it was, 1995. And some of my viewers are, are so young that you were a little child, probably playing with your toys back then. I'm an old man. <laughs> uh, I remember the first Gulf War. I remember a lot of the things. I remember Ronald Reagan being the president. Verse 3, the aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, teachers of good things. You say, well, see, it didn't say anything about sober. Keep reading. That they may teach the young women to be sober, hmm. to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, career-minded, female. Oh, no, it doesn't say. It says keepers at home. Good obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. A rotten woman will cause people to blaspheme this blessed book. Oh, you're one of those uh, Christians. Oh, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, your little Bible and the thing. Yeah, and look at you, you hypocrite. Christian ladies are supposed to be different than the lost women out there. You're supposed to have higher standards. We're going to see that later on. All right? There's supposed to be something different there. And you know what the biggest Part of it is being sober, serious. The world says, uh, hey, women, back 100 years ago, um, you don't need to wear dresses all the time. You don't need to have your hair grow long. Put the makeup on. Lift those skirts up. Start wearing pants. You're just as good as a man. Cut your hair. Hey, women's suffrage, let's get you out there into the workforce. Let's get, hey, World War II, you have to go to the factories to help out. And, you know, since you're here, you might as well put the uniform on, the pants or whatever. And, and then after that, you, hey, you got a good job, you're making good money, that really helps out the family, and, and away you go. Yeah. And pretty soon you're losing that sobriety. And a lot of other things, too, there. Hmm. Got a little way, a little way from the uh, Bible there. Verse 6, young men likewise exhort to be sober-minded. Hmm. So it isn't just some kind of a thing of, oh, that sober, being sober is for old people. We don't have to be serious as young people. We can live it up and party and, and go around and act nuts and everything. No, you're to be sober-minded. Very important. Verse 7, in all things showing thyself a pattern of good works. In doctrine, doctrine showing uncorruptness, gravity, sincerity, sound speech, 
that cannot be condemned. Hmm, get back to that in a minute. That he that is of the contrary part may be ashamed, having no evil thing to say of you. Um, do you monitor your speech, young person, young man? Do you monitor it? Or do you occasionally uh, speak French? It's one of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Oh, excuse my French. I hear that thing all the time. You know, I get around people and whatever else, and they find out I'm a preacher, and all of a sudden they rip out some cuss word, and they say, oh, excuse my French. You didn't speak French. You cussed. Why are you lying? Sound speech. There's no guile find, found in the mouth of Jesus Christ. He didn't use profanity. Why do you? That's a problem. You know, I mean, one of the greatest ways to ruin your testimony is just go out and cuss like a sailor. Well, I'm a Christian, though. Sure you are. Sure you are. And it's so funny, you know, you get all these people and they'll, they'll get mad at me because I condemn professing Christians that use profanity. And yet if I came out and I used profanity one time in any of my videos, just one time, it would be all over the Internet. Look at the hypocrite. Look at the fake. Whatever else. We have proof. He, look at this. He, he used profanity. And they'd be right. I would be a hypocrite. But you see, I'm not going to. Why? Because I'm sober. I'm not going to lose control of my mouth. Verse 9, Exhort servants to be obedient unto their own masters and to please them well in all things, not answering again, not purloining, but showing all good fidelity that they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in all things. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. I did a whole study on this. Just an amazing thing. Oh, God's grace is there. You don't have to think about your sin. Enjoy your salvation. You can go on and live like the devil. You're just a carnal Christian. Don't worry about it. Everything's fine. Whatever. No, the grace of God teaches you that you're supposed to deny worldliness and ungodly lusts and to live soberly. You know, it's a sober thing to think of the fact that Jesus had to die on the cross to pay for your sins and my sins. An innocent man had to die in my place for all the disgusting things that I've done. Hmm. I think maybe I owe him some things like a changed life. I think maybe I owe him my life, my service, my all, everything. That's a uh, sobering thought, isn't it? I'm going to stand before him someday at the judgment seat of Christ. And I'm going to have to give an account for everything I've done after I got saved. Sobering, isn't it? You might want to get serious about your life might want to get serious about sanctification. Oh, I'm just going to dabble around with sin for a little while longer. Oh, you're rather foolish. Verse 13, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. What do you think the world's going to think of you when you're sober? Hey, John, you're going to go out with us uh, drinking the night after, you know, after work is over. We're going to go, a couple of guys are going to get down to the barn. You coming? The bar, excuse me. Well, maybe barn now, you know, they're probably serving alcohol in barns because the bars are closed. But, you know, are you coming down to the bar? No, I'm not going to do that. Why, man? Oh, you got some other plans? Yeah, actually, I'm going to go home and read the Bible. What? Huh? <laughs> okay, John, <laughs> that's funny. Really, what are you doing? No, that's actually what I'm going to do. I'm going to go home and read the Bible. Oh. Um, oh, oh, okay. Uh, cool, uh, okay, cool, man. What, whatever. Um, so, is that all you do? Well, I'm going to be eating some food. Uh, I'm trying to get my health back in shape. And uh, I gave up alcohol a long time ago. And I'm, the Lord's been convicting me about uh, even soda pop. It's really not good for me. It's not helped me in my sanctification and walk with the Lord and... And uh, I don't smoke anymore either. And uh, I used to watch movies while I was eating my supper, but I don't watch them. And gave up my television, actually took it out back and hit it with a sledgehammer and destroyed that. Oh, huh. okay, yeah. Well, uh, hey, it was nice talking to you, John. Got to go. 
What's the problem? A little bit too sober for the buddies at work. Get together with family and, they, and hey, you want something to drink? I don't do that anymore. Huh? Yeah, you see, I got saved. I'm born again now. I don't really want anything to do with the alcohol. Oh, okay. Well, we want to we want to have a good time. Come on, man! Don't don't spoil the time. Your grandparents are here. All your relatives are here. Don't make problems. All right. Don't start cramming your religious stuff down our throats. Just just get along with everybody. Don't make problems. What's the problem? You're a little bit too sober for them. That's the problem. You see? See why we need to have a call to sobriety? We need to start getting more serious about the things of the Lord. Why? Uh, well, we're looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of, our, of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And He's supposed to purify unto Himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Word of rebuke. Hmm. I'm going to show you something here because there's, there's so many issues with this whole thing of sobriety. Okay, People being serious. We are, we are supposed to be serious as Bible believers. We say, okay, I follow the book. I'm a Christian. I'm not going to do certain things. I know if I, if I let my flesh go out and do whatever else and act like a nut, and, and think, it's just going to make more problems for sin. So I'm going to be sober. I'm going to be grave. I'm going to be temperate. Like the Bible says I'm supposed to do. I mean, notice it's not just... that. I think the interesting thing about Titus chapter 2 is it isn't just, hey, the elderly, be sober. The young people, you just enjoy your time. And everyone is supposed to be sober. Everyone is supposed to have standards of sobriety. It's, it's just right there over and over and over again. We're going to look at a lot more scriptures here. But I'm going to play a video coming up just as an example of what a church service looks like that is not sober. Okay, this is a Baptist church. I'll apologize in advance because it is ultra nutty. Um, I have never, I've been to church, Baptist churches that are like this, but I would have never stayed for a service like this. I'd have gotten up and walked out. I would have just said, okay, you people are a bunch of nuts. Um, we'll talk more about this when we're done with this video. Hopefully it won't vex you too bad, but uh, here it is. Take a look at this. Foolish virgins in will find they have here been left behind. They dirty empty vessels and the left for dead. They awoke themselves to try for the left some more to buy. But the bridegroom comes and we have gone with him. I will be by. All right, so there you have it. Um, that's uh, what a lot of people call church. 
Okay, and, and I figured after seeing something so vexing, I could, I'd have to reward you with something nice to look at. So we came out here, a little field trip out to another lake here in northern Maine. So a little bit more pleasant to look at. Um, I don't know if you can see it or not, by the way. There's a, back in there, there's something sticking out of the water. That's not a Loch Ness Monster, okay? So just, <laughs> I was giving my son a hard time. I said, look, it's a Loch Ness Monster. Where's the head, though? You know, so... But um, let's look at some scriptures here on this whole thing, this thing of sobriety, because it is a major issue. Um, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. Turn there in your King James Bible. 1 Corinthians, excuse me. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 26. The Bible says, How is it then, brethren, when ye come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. And we're going to see here about the order, that there's supposed to be order, not just chaos when the, the saints assemble together. But I actually read a thing from a uh, charismatic uh, kook that was coming out and saying that this is actually the order of service, that everybody's supposed to have something to contribute. So everybody stands up and somebody stands up and starts speaking in tongues. Somebody stands up, starts to sing a, a psalm or whatever, and everybody just stands up and does what they feel like doing. That's not what Paul's saying. He says, how is it then, brethren? He's saying, I'm hearing these things about you, and this isn't good, that there's no order there. There's no you know, authority within that assembly of the saints. That's not a good thing. Okay? Um, it's just chaotic. And you'll see that with a lot of these Baptist churches. I was going to include a thing of, uh, you know, uh, Ruckman's church when he was still around. And it's, it's much the same thing of people standing up and screaming and jumping up and running around the church and everything else. And, and he even said about how that, you know, uh, if you don't, if you didn't run or whatever, you know, whatever, you know, I'm going to be running when I get up there to be with the Lord. Where's that stuff at in scripture? It's not there. Uh, they, they call it uh, enjoying their salvation. Um, chapter and verse on that, it's not there. Uh, how does that line up with you can enjoy your salvation by running and jumping and screaming and acting like you're crazy, um, but there's supposed to be sobriety. There's supposed to be you know soberness there. You're instructed over and over and over again to be sober. How does that work? Um, let's look at... Uh, Look, jump down to verse uh, 33 here in 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 33, For God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. When you see these guys and they're, they're acting crazy and everything else, do you think of peace? Is that a peaceful setting? This is a peaceful setting. Again, another reason why we came out here to finish this study. There's peace here. Why? Why? It's quiet. It's calm. You see what I'm saying? And I'm not. I'm not saying that that you know, everybody that's ever been acted wild or whatever else and, and stuff that they're all lost or they're all you know heretics or something. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is it's not scriptural what they're doing. It's very fleshly, and I have known many of these Baptists. Uh, that yell and shout and scream and just go go berserk. They have all kinds of flesh problems. The ones that I've known. So whatever you want to think about that. Verse 34. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home, for it is a shame for women to speak in the church. There's, that doesn't mean it's a church building. Okay, get that. Understand uh, something here from the New Testament. When it says in the church, it's talking about when the saints are gathered together. They, they have assembled together. Then you are in the church. All right. Um, I'm in the church right now. My wife is in the church. Um, if you're saved, you're in the church. But we aren't assembling together in, in, with the saints. All right. Um, and of course, you know, you can see there, she's to ask her husband at home. A woman's to ask her husband at home. Well, then it's not just commanded that, you know, there's a difference when, you know, you're in the church in the sense of spiritually, your spiritual position, but there's the assembling of the saints. There's a different situation there. 
when it's the assembling of the saints, hey, there's to be order here. Women, please be silent. The men are here to teach. Okay, that's what's going on there. On your way home, you're still in the church, in the sense of in the body of Christ, but now you can speak. Now a woman gets home and she says, honey, I got some questions for you. He doesn't say, uh, by the way, you know, we'll call the pastor. He'll answer them for you. You know, I'm not, we pay him to, to give us answers or whatever. No, no. A man is supposed to be there to lead his home, to rule his house. Right? That's supposed to be there. Verse 36. What? Came the word of God out from you, or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. <laughs> That's something it's hard to, to do sometimes. There are people that are just ignorant and you just want to fight with them and, and get contentious with them. Sometimes you just have to say, you know what? If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. And that's one of my big struggles. That really is just letting things go. Just saying, you know what? Whatever. Walk away. Let them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. You don't want to listen? Whatever. I have other things to do. Uh, my pride gets in the way of that a lot of times. And I'm, I'm just being straight and honest with you and whatever else. Something that, that I struggle with. And as I get older, I think I'll get better with it. But uh, it's hard. You know, sometimes if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Just let people alone. Wherefore, brethren, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Let all things be done decently and in order. If things are being done in order, do you think you could call that being sober? I would say yes. Um, somebody who has disorder in their lives, the best example of that would be a drunk. Somebody who's a drunkard. They're stumbling all over the place. I don't know where to put my keys at. And they're, you know, vomiting on this and stumbling and falling over and hitting the floor. And, you know, their life is not in order. But as a Christian, your life should have order. There should be sobriety there. Okay. Next, we're going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 13. Turn your, there in your King James Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 13. It says, For whether we be beside ourselves, it is to God, or whether we be sober, it is for your calls. You know, one of the, the reasons that I'm supposed to be sober is for your calls. I'm supposed to be an example to you. If I'm acting like some kind of an insane lunatic and jumping up and down and screaming and running and doing cartwheels, making a fool out of myself, um, that's not a very good example. Uh, I'm supposed to be sober for your calls, for your sake. Um, I mean, how would you how would you feel if if a video came out of me being drunk and falling all over the place, and there I am out, you know, stumbling down the street and running into a telephone pole or something, you know? Would you respect me? I don't think so. I'm supposed to be sober for your calls. And by the way, it's not just me. It's you as well. We're to be, supposed to have sobriety in our lives. We're not supposed to be drunken. We're not supposed to act like we're insane and whatever else and all this charismatic stuff. Um, and again, it, you know, if you don't understand where the charismatic thing came from, it was the revival meetings, this supposed great awakening thing and whatever. And there was some good stuff that happened from that. But then the Methodists started coming in with their, their weird ecstatic experiences and people going, getting the shakes and whatever else and people falling on the floor and screaming and giving a shout and all this other stuff that they started to do. The Baptists started to adapt a lot of that stuff. And then the Pentecostals came out of that movement. And they're the ones that are still doing a lot of that you know, type of nutty nonsense. But there are Baptists that just, they do it. And, um, you know, and I've been to some of these Baptist churches where the people shout and, and scream and holler and whatever else. And like I said, every time I've seen it, um, you know, it's people that are carnal. You, you see them after the service and, and the, the, what happened to the shouting? What happened to the screaming and running and whatever? And, and oh, the Spirit's not moving now. Mm -hmm. Sure. First Timothy chapter 2. Turn in your King James Bible to 1 Timothy chapter 2. 
You know, um, as times get worse and worse, uh, we need to be more and more sober. We need to take things more seriously. And I fear that the, a lot of the people out there in the lost world, they, they see the, the fun that uh, the average church building is trying to give to its, its uh, audience, not really congregation anymore, its audience. And they, they say, well, you know, there should be some seriousness there. There should be some, some difference there. And they don't see it. And uh, as a result, people just think, well, I guess there's, there's no real warning coming from the churches, coming from the Christians. So I guess why should I take anything seriously? It's the lack of sobriety that turns lost people away. Lost people want to see something different about those Christians. Even the most radical, anti-Christian, God-hating, Bible-rejecting atheist out there still wants to see standards with a Christian. And when they don't, they say, that hypocrite confirms my feelings. Look at them. They're just, they're just as drunken and wicked as I am. Yeah. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 8 through 15. I will therefore that men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting. In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel, with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broided hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. Let the women learn in silence with all subjection, like we read in 1 Corinthians 14. But I suffer not a woman to teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve, and Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. There's your two references to sobriety in your King James Bible. Both pointed to women. But sobriety is just another way of saying sober, being sober. But how many women today are following what's going on there? I mean, you got female preachers. Again, you know, the, the Methodists, ever since the very beginning, um, John Wesley, his mother, actually would preach. And we're talking back in the 1700s, uh, when people were a lot, you know, had a lot better heads on their shoulders than people today. There was a lot less of this liberal, you know, female rights, women's suffrage, all this other stuff. And yet you had uh, John Wesley's mother actually preaching from the pulpit. And Methodism, to my knowledge, has never taken a stand against female preaching. And yet the Bible's just crystal clear right there. Well, what's going on? Uh, the women aren't following sobriety. That's a big part of it. They don't take the Bible seriously, you see. Remember, you know, one of the definitions of being sober is serious. Grave, temperate. That's what you're supposed to be. Well, well, you know, I, I just think that, you know, our Methodist book of discipline can just kind of overthrow the Bible in those areas and whatever else. No, it can't. And if you're a woman, you should seek to be a lady, a lady that follows the scriptures right here. First Timothy chapter two, verses eight through 15 and say, you know what? It says sobriety. Hmm. Shamefacedness. What is that sort of bashfulness being quiet, not being a big mouth, loud type of woman. I mean, if you're, a, if you're a woman out there, for goodness sake, study the Bible and see what it says about the kind of a woman that is, is pleasing in God's sight and do that. It isn't about male, chauvinistic, sexist, whatever kind of stuff that the modern people come up with. It's about what does the Bible say? And then I want to line myself up with that. I do the same thing. Okay, I go through here and say, okay, what, what does the Bible say a man should be like? Then I better be like that. Why? Uh, because I want to be sober. You see? I want to take the Bible seriously. Let's jump down to chapter 3, verse 1. This is a true saying, if a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A lot of the new versions will mess with that. If anybody desires to be a bishop or whatever, the office of a bishop, anyone or whatever, you know. No, it says, if a man, not a woman. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach. 
not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Did you see the word sober? Look at verse 2. Vigilant, sober, of good behavior. Hmm. Funny, too, that uh, it says, verse 3, not given to wine. Um, I'm not a drinker. I never have been. And quite frankly, I never will be. <laughs> I have tried wine, and I think it's disgusting. There's no thrill at all to me with drinking wine. I think it just tastes like cough syrup. <laughs> Uh, growing up, you know, I'd have uh, um, NyQuil and some of the Robitussin and some of this other chemical cocktail garbage that's primarily alcohol. And uh, that stuff really put a bad taste in my mouth, which now, you know, has translated into even the, the very taste of alcohol is just ugh, disgusting to me. And I thank the Lord for that. Um, I've said about this in other studies, but I had two other big influences. One was I had a uh, an uncle on my mother's side of the family, and uh, he ruined his marriage with alcohol, with drunkenness. He wasn't sober. And um, secondly, my father was an EMT, um, worked with ambulance crews and things, went out on a lot of accidents and things, and he'd come home and tell us stories of, of seeing what drunk driving did to people and horrible bloody accidents and just bad stuff all around. And uh, so those were two big influences on me growing up. And I thank the Lord for that. Um, again, I think it, you know, looking back, I think it was Lord preparing me for what I am today, to be a preacher, to just say, not given to wine. Hey, uh, do you want some? You want some wine, brother? No, thank you. I'm just not given to that stuff. No, thank you. I don't want it. I don't want anything to cloud my mind to make me, uh, you know, less effective with preaching. So, but let's continue here. Uh, verse 6, Not a novice, lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. There's a lot of people that do that. Um, I'm going to be preaching a study at some point in time in the future. I've been thinking about this for a while. And that's the kind of a man that God will call to preach. And uh, there's, a, there's a number of, of different types of men that make good preachers. And then there's other types of men that make horrible preachers. And, you know... Uh, one of the things about being a novice is it's not just an age thing. Um, there are men that, that are older and they're still novices because they've never experienced a lot of things in life. Um, they don't know what it's like to suffer. They don't know what it's like to have a hard physical job or, or you know, I mean, there's guys that have come out of the military and whatever else, get saved, get out of the military, and they know what it's like to be shot at. They know what it's like to suffer in war. Uh, they make good preachers. But you get some of these little incubator baby type of guys that uh, I was raised in a Baptist church and I got saved when I was, you know, just five years old or something. And I went off to college and I graduated from college and, and they just little, little smooth faced little babies got the hands of a woman, you know, they don't know what it's like to suffer. They're novices. They could be 40, 50 years old, but they're novices. I mean, why did Jesus Christ, when he comes to the earth, why did he go out and look for commercial fishermen? because there were men that had character. But let's continue, verse seven. I'll be doing a study on that in the future. Moreover, he must have a good report of them which are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. How can you have a good report of them that are without if you haven't really experienced anything? Just some little seminary, little PhD or whatever else that's going to your little Bible college and whatever else, and you come into the area and you're, you're a nice guy that goes up door to door and, and says nice things to people. And you have a nice community church and, you know. The good report for somebody like that is just that they're useless. You know, and they're not really a threat to anybody or anything. So, you know, the lost world says, yeah, you know, whatever. He's a nice guy, I guess. <laughs> um, how, about, how about earning your stripes? Okay. Uh, you can fix things and you can you have a lot of understanding, a lot of different issues because you uh, worked for a long time with your hands before entering the ministry. Almost like the Lord Jesus, you know, working for 30 years as a carpenter before starting his earthly ministry. 
that's God manifest in the flesh. But for you out there, the Baptist seminarians and whatever else, you know something more than God manifest in the flesh. Sure you do. Verse 8, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these also first be proved, and let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless, proving somebody. Oh no, it's just a profession of faith. You just have, you say, I believed, intellectually consented to the facts of the gospel as recorded in scripture, therefore I got saved. Um, and then I can just do whatever I want. I go to seminary, which chapter and verse, there is none, uh, saying go to Bible college or seminary. But you know, what's this thing about being proved? That takes a while, okay? Again, you know, I could do a whole thing right on this passage here. How many people just do not line up with what God uses to, you know, as his qualifications to call people into ministry. But uh, continuing here. Um, verse 9, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience. And let these, oh, we already did read that, sorry. Verse 11, even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. So it isn't just, you know, well, you know, this brother so-and-so, he's a great man and knows the Bible really well. And you know, he kind of has some struggles with his wife. She's a little bit carnal or whatever. No, 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 no. Um, the wife has to be sober, not double-tongued. She's not a backstabber. She doesn't come to church on Sunday morning and say, oh, hello, how are you this week? Oh, it's just so wonderful to see you, the whole thing, you know, and then the woman walks away and she says, oh, I can't believe she's actually dressed that way. And oh, I, I've heard things and, oh, let me tell you, like a lot of Baptist wives I've encountered over the years, you know, <laughs> Baptist women, some of the finest out there, let me tell you. <laughs> First Thessalonians chapter five, go there next. First Thessalonians chapter five, verses four through nine. And notice the distinction here, again, between lost and saved. And I've preached this passage many, many times when it comes to the, the catching up of the body of Christ before the time of Jacob's trouble versus those that get left behind. And, um, but look at the, how this ties into the thing of sobriety, being sober. Verse 4, But ye, brethren, are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be, what? Sober. Hmm. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for an, hope the, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Now you'd think if the Bible just keeps saying it over and over and over again to a Christian, you think maybe we should pay attention to it. We need a call to sobriety. We need a call to say, hey, you know what? We need to be serious here. And again, you know, going to church buildings over the years, how many of you? It isn't just, oh, my personal feeling. Oh, Brian's been hurt by Baptist churches and we understand and that's why he's better. No, no, no. All of you out there. Those of you who have gone to church buildings for years and years and years, how much sobriety was really being practiced there? You get done with the church service and there's talking about the weather and talk about politics and talk about sporting events and talk about new cars and talk about this and sobriety. Hey, uh, brethren, we need to talk about some things here. Um, turns out that they're trying to build a uh, casino in the area. Uh, what can we do to protest this thing? We need to be serious about this. We don't want that kind of those kind of people coming to this area. Hey, um, yeah, I also saw that the Catholic Church is getting some more members. Well, how are we going to go down and maybe we could straight preach in front of the thing? Or, um, hey, does, brother, did you get those new tracks built or, or written yet and things? Can we get those things printed? We're going to need some more tracks. Can we? What church have you, have you ever gone to that that's the talk afterwards? I've never been in one, ever. And I've been in militant, you know, Ruckmanite type churches, Baptist churches. I remember going actually to see Peter Ruckman. At the time I had a chance to meet him, it was one of his graduates. I uh, can't think of what the guy's name is right now, but 
one of his older graduates. And, um, you know, they were a wild, crazy Baptist church, you know, doing cartwheels and running the aisles and all this stuff. Not very sober. But uh, the service got done that Ruckman did, which I had the video of up for a while. I don't know if it's still on here or not. But, um, and the, the thing gets done, and his church members go back to the kitchen area, and they're, they're walking around afterwards with, with uh, fried chicken, eating fried chicken, just walking around. And, and a couple times I looked, and I said, Hi, you know, I want to get in, just talk to somebody. And they just come, you know, uh, and they just walked away. And I'm thinking, the great Dr. Ruckman just preached, and, and let's talk about the Bible. Let's talk about, hey, what, you know, what are you guys doing in the area? We're visitors. We took our whole house church down, rented a van, took the whole house church down. Um, you know, we met uh, one guy that was talking to us from Rhode Island. You know, it was down in Delaware where we were at at this meeting, and the guy came the whole way from Rhode Island the night before or something like that, drove the whole way, got there for the church service, was in there and whatever else, and we were talking to him. And, you know, but nobody else wanted to talk. It's all just kids running around chasing each other and, and teenagers over here kind of flirting with each other and one's over here eating fried chicken and these people doing this and these ones running out to their car so they can go out to the restaurant to eat Sunday afternoon and sobriety, being sober, not there. Church buildings are social clubs, brethren. That's all they are. First Peter chapter 1. Our church isn't that way. Ours isn't that way. We're we're militant. And whatever. I see that all the time too. That's another thing that cracks me up. You know, we're not like that. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> I get pastors that get irritated at me sometimes. You know, you're turning people away from church buildings. Well, thank you for that intelligence. I, I appreciate that. You know, the intel there. Not intelligence necessarily, but. I'm glad to hear it. I'm glad to hear that I'm turning people away from church buildings, getting them out of them things, and having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Meet together with other saved brethren. Not wasting your time with, with million dollar buildings that are not even backed up by scripture. Our church building didn't cost a million dollars. <laughs> yes, yes, I know, I know, I know. I, I, I get it. First Peter chapter 1, verse 13 through 16, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen to that? The, the grace that's to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ? Do you deserve to, to be caught up and not experience death? The Bible says the wages of sin is death. You've earned death. You've sinned. I've sinned, I earned death. But you know what? There's going to be grace that's brought unto me at the revelation of Jesus Christ. All right, Brian, you've had enough. And you and you and you and all the other saved people, you've experienced enough, you've gone through enough. Okay, come up hither. Come up to meet your Lord. Grace. But uh, how should we be? Well, we're going to enjoy our salvation, brother. Amen. Oh, I got to go and run or something. I got to just start doing cartwheels. And I guess I should be like that one Baptist guy and he you know, did a backflip or whatever, flipped into the baptismal thing. Well, there's plenty of water here. I guess I should just run out there and just scream and jump into the water to prove how good a Christian I am. That's not what the Bible says. We are to be sober. You say, well, the end's coming here soon. You know, we ought to get excited, brethren. We ought to be excited. The rapture could be happening soon. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Be sober. And, and why would it say there about the end times um, that you should gird up the loins of your mind? Um, probably because the deception is going to be so bad. You have to protect yourself. Earlier in 1 Thessalonians 5, it talked about putting on the helmet of salvation. You know, it's so funny because you get into conspiracy stuff, they'll say, oh, you wear your tinfoil hat wearing, you know, nut or something like this. No, I'm not a tinfoil hat wearer. I'm a uh, helmet of salvation wearer. 
And there are certain things, I don't want to hear that. Sorry, no. Fiery darts of the wicked come and they say, you could die of coronavirus. It's very bad for you. Think. Nope, sorry. I'm not worried about it. Why? Because I'm saved by Jesus Christ. I have the hope of salvation. I'm not worried about some stupid little thing. It doesn't even make you sick. And if it does make you sick, you might have it and get over it and not even know it. Boy, we have to destroy the world over that. But, you know, the hope of salvation. It's a helmet. It protects your thoughts. Gird up the loins of your mind. Stand firm on the things of Scripture. You see? And how do you do that? Uh, I think you have to be sober. Take some things seriously. Don't act like you're drunken. Hmm. Verse 14. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. That's going to be next week. We're going to do a call to holiness. Um, again, something that is very much forsaken in the modern uh, believe only, whatever kind of a, this easy believism, whatever you want to call the satanic nonsense. Um, where's the holiness at? Where's a call to holiness? Well, you know, we all are, none of us perfect, and we all just kind of struggle with things, and we all, yeah, yeah, yeah. Holiness, sobriety, righteousness. Those things are supposed to be there. They're written over and over and over again. And yet you have people that just, eh, whatever, I don't care. Let's bring in the, the modern churches. Let's have rock music here in the church. Let's ride our dirt bikes around inside the sanctuary of the big pagan building. Let's have video games for the kids. And, and you know, I, mem I remember going to the one Baptist church. They were giving out pixie sticks. You know, um, collared sugar. <laughs> uh, the, we're, we're having some discipline issues with the children in Sunday school. G gee, I wonder why. I mean, you know, wow. Oh, it must be an attack of the devil. Or it could be the fact that you're giving them tubes of sugar to eat because they said their memory verse is right. Uh, be, be sober now, children. Let's all be quiet. Let's all pay attention to the Sunday school lesson. Okay, d finish your pixie stick. Okay, now now come on. Let's Let's get to calm down now. Conservative, Baptist, Jack Hiles style church. <laughs> um, yeah. Go to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Hmm. And above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves, for char charity shall cover the multitude of sins. Um, there's a lot of bad stuff going on right now. Okay? Um, we need to have charity for each other. And I, you know, I have more charity than I should sometimes for people. Um, but as a preacher in a public forum, I can't be sitting there looking at you in person. So what do I do? I will have to just attack a sin really, really harshly. And sometimes I hit people and it doesn't seem like I have charity and whatever else. Well, come and visit me and you'll see that I have a great, a great deal of charity. Um, some woman wants to come and talk about the Bible and whatever else. She can be sitting there smelling like cigarettes and with immodest clothing on and whatever else. But if she's truly interested in the Bible and the things of the Lord, I'm not going to say a word about the other stuff. Somebody comes and says, hey, brother, you know, that's a young man or whatever. And he says, I'm really struggling with the thing of pornography or I'm struggling with video game addiction or rock music or whatever else. And, and, th and I see that the struggle's real. I'm going to have charity. Absolutely. But I'm also going to be sober. I'm going to be serious. And I'm going to tell them, hey, you know, I've struggled with some of that stuff myself. Um, you need to get that thing under control. And I'm, I'm going to be sober. I'm not just going to say, oh, man, come on, don't think about it. You need to just come on out. Just, man, just enjoy life. Don't worry about it. God's grace is there. You know, 
use grace for lasciviousness, you know, as an excuse for your lasciviousness. Um, just have fun, man. Enjoy your salvation. Run around, do cartwheels. You want to jump up and down and scream? And I remember hearing, you know, the one Baptist church, they were, they were in the front row and they were taking uh, hymn books and screaming and, and throwing the hymn books up in the air and, and whatever else. Is that being sober? No. Um, if I was in a uh, church like that, I'd get out of there. I would. It's not sobriety. I mean, you know, again, what is the standard that you're going to be judged by? Right here. The Bible above me. It's always been that way. And the Bible says over and over and over again, sober, sober, sobriety, sober, sober. But the end of all things is at hand, be ye therefore sober. The end of all things is at hand. Yeah, it's, it's so frustrating because you come out into this world and you say, boy, it's so beautiful. Maybe we could turn things back to uh, uh, righteous nations and godly nations and godly people. And maybe if we would just get some constitutional reform and bring back gold and silver currency as our currency, you know, we can end this whole the Federal Reserve thing. And, the, and, and maybe if we get rid of the pharmaceutical thing and get people into natural health, and maybe if we could get rid of the new versions and get people to the King James Bible, and, and it, it's not going to happen. Not happening. Why? Because the Bible already told you what's going to happen. So what are we left with? We have to be sober. Just that simple. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. Okay? I want to make a comment on verse 9. We'll talk about verse 8 then. But knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. All right? Um, it doesn't mean that the same afflictions there that are in the world that the world suffers with. No, it's saying the brethren that are in the world are going through some of the same, the same stuff that you are. All right. If you're a young person and you're single and you're not sure if you should think about marriage and you're thinking the Lord could be coming, but I'd sure like to get married. and what, You're not alone. There's other people going through that. Um, you say, well, man, I just, I don't know what in the world's going on. I used to get along with my relatives. I got saved. I got born again. And they're just turning on me, and it's weird, and what in the world? There's other Christians that are going through the same thing. Right now, almost the exact same thing that you're going through. And you name the situation, whatever it is, those same afflictions are being accomplished in your brethren all over the world. Other countries, you don't even speak the same language. You don't live in the same area. You don't eat the same foods. You don't whatever. Same thing, though, exactly. That's why we have the fellowship of the Spirit. You actually run into real Bible believers and they're saying, oh, I'm just so vexed by this world. Yeah, me too. Oh, isn't it awful? I mean, you go into the grocery store and they got, you know, it used to be that they'd have kind of calming, soothing music back when I was little, you know, back in the 1980s, born in 1975. So we're way back there, but they used to play calming, soothing music. Now they play rock music. What in the world? What's going on? You know, that's vexing to me. It's upsetting to me. And I talk to other Christians. Yeah. Oh, oh man. It just it makes it so hard to fight the flesh and whatever else when they're forcing this music on you. We have fellowship in the Spirit. You run into somebody and they say, oh, I'm a Christian. And uh, yeah, things, man, things are really going good with my job. And, and, uh, and you say, boy, the rock music's vexing, isn't it? No, it's not so bad. I don't know. I don't, I don't really mind it. I mean, I guess technically, yes, it's sinful. But I don't really mind it. I just, I, you know, okay, um, how do you get along with your relatives? Oh, we get along great. Everybody loves me. We get, we get along just fine. They're not all saved. I'm praying for them. I'm praying. I invite them to church once in a while. And, and you start thinking, I'll just kind of start backing up here from you. Uh, go away. <laughs> you know, there's no fellowship of the spirit. I, one of my favorite things that posties like to say, they like to say that, uh, 
you know, we, we don't know what it's like to suffer. And we're going to have our time of suffering coming. And Christ's church is going to be purified. And, all, and, I'm, and I think to myself, you don't know what it's like to suffer? Okay, and you want me to believe that you're saved? You're not saved. Our time is ending. You see? But lost people? Oh, we're, we're, it's not so bad right now. I don't think it's that bad. And, yeah. If you're going through bad things, you can be assured that there's other believers out there that are going through the same thing. And when you run into them, you're going to have instant fellowship because you're going to see that those same afflictions that are in you are in your brethren. But look at uh, verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Um, the devil understands prophecy. He understands it quite well. The devil quotes scripture. When he shows up, you don't see the devil showing up uh, drunk in the Bible. The devil showing up with, you know, getting caught with a bunch of prostitutes or he's doing some methamphetamines or something like that. That's not the devil. Uh, the devil knows scripture. He knows it very well. And the devil knows prophecy. He understands his future is fixed. It's secure. There's no chance for the devil. He can't say, hey, you know what? I've really, I've just come to the end of myself now and I need to get saved. <laughs> His doom is already fixed and sealed and secure. So what's he want to do? He wants to devour people. And so he moves about there. As our text, the text says, uh, um, walketh about. He walketh about as a roaring lion. And you know what the, the bad part about it is? Um, lions don't roar until after they've killed their prey. It has always impressed me. I've seen videos of lions in the wild. Um, we don't have actual, you know, lion, African lions, but uh, I've been around mountain lions, and um, it is a freakish thing. I was out in Montana, northern Montana, the one time, northwestern Montana, Yak, Montana. You can look that up. It's up near the uh, Idaho border. My brother lived out there. And he took me fishing and it was real, a lot of rocks, kind of canyons and whatever else, perfect, you know, mountain lion territory. And uh, they had actually shot a mountain lion out there. It was stalking a little boy while he was riding his bicycle to school. Uh, some people that my brother knew. And that mountain lion was 10 feet long from the tip of its nose to the tip of its tail. 10 feet. And it weighed over 200 pounds. That's a big mountain lion. Okay, that's the kind of mountain lion that's not going to look at somebody like me and say, ooh, I better stay away. It's going to look at me and say, I wonder if I could get that guy. He'd be a nice meal. <laughs> okay, they're, they're big. I don't know if, I don't think that there's any mountain lions in northern Maine. Um, never heard of anything like that. But the point is, um, I was fishing this one time, and I just got this really eerie feeling, just kind of a, like I'm being hunted kind of a thing. And I heard some little pebbles rolling down over the rock that was above me, rolling down and toot into the water and toot into the water. And I thought, and I called out my brother's name. I said, hey, is that you up there? No answer. And I could hear kind of a, somewhat of a breathing type of a thing and, and real soft walking. And it was, I just got, the hair stood up on the back of my neck and I just got chills all over and I thought, Oh boy, it's a mountain lion, no question. So I jumped into the river and made my way down to where my brother was at. And I uh, thought I was crazy till I explained the situation. You know, I was being stalked by a mountain lion. Um, but they'll stalk you. And why? Because they want to devour you. Um, you say, what point are you trying to make there, brother? The point I'm trying to make is the devil is subtle. Um, you drive down the road, you see a, a strip club or something and XXX adult blah, blah, blah and, and alcohol and drugs and what the devil's not there. That's the flesh. You say, what about the, the Illuminati and the Jesuits and whatever and stuff? Well, the devil's a little bit more there, but the, the devil, his favorite place, if you read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, his favorite place is in pulpits. His ministers appears the ministers of righteousness. And that doesn't mean, well, you know, righteous Catholics or something. No, no, oh, my, no. Guys that use the King James Bible. 
are some of the most satanic, most evil people in this world. And if you don't know your King James Bible, they'll get you. They'll devour you. They'll turn you away from the simplicity that is in Jesus Christ. You say, well, how do I tell the difference? Well, you have to have this, you know, fellowship of the Spirit. That has to be there. Um, and there's a number of ways that you can tell these guys. There's a number of ways. It's not just, well, you know, he said that a little bit wrong. or whatever. Oh, no, they'll, they'll, there's a secret underlying hatred for this book and for Jesus Christ and for holiness and righteousness. And you'll see that. You don't have to repent of your sins. How can you repent of all your sins? You know, look out, look out. Sin is negative. Real preachers preach against sin. They don't try to justify it. Um, actually, the Bible teaches that Jesus burned in hell. He had, when, he went, when he died on the cross, that wasn't enough. He had to go burn in hell, like the new IFB teaches. They're all Satan's ministers. Why would you want Jesus to have to go and burn in hell? When the Bible says nothing of the kind, the Bible never says that Jesus burned in hell to pay for your sins. He shed his blood on the cross. Death, burial, resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15 verses 1 through 4 doesn't say about anything about going to hell and burning to pay for your sins, to make an atonement for sin. It doesn't say anything like that. What kind of a minister gets off talking about Jesus burning in hell? Well, that would be a man that's a follower of Satan, like any new IFB preacher. Mm -hmm. There's an underlying hatred for God's Word. A lot of these false preachers, they'll come out and they'll say, yes, the King James Bible, it's the only Bible I use. It's the Bible I prefer. It's the Bible that I got saved with. But it could be better translated here. And this word here isn't actually in the Receptus. And over the here, this thing should be better said this way. And that thing should be... What are they doing? They're like their master, like a roaring lion. Just slowly... I'm just here to preach the gospel to you. I'm your friend. I want to see you in church. I just want to make sure that they, and they get close and, and they get you. And I've seen it time and time and time again. People that are saved and they get near these ministers of Satan and they don't take heed to what I've said to them. And these devils just come and they just grab a hold of them and drag them down. You say, well, uh, how do we fight it? Well, what's our sermon? A call to uh, sobriety? You have to be sober. Be, um, be very careful about preachers that appeal to you with uh, special sermons, the way that they talk and everything like that. Be careful. Be sober. Acts chapter 26. When there. Go back to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, verse 24 and 25. And as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself. Much learning doth make thee mad. That's what you'll get if you're, if you're a saved man that preaches or any kind of a thing. If you're educated, if you know the Bible really well and you can really give a lot of facts and figures and statistics, They'll say, you've learned too much. You're crazy. Much learning doth make thee mad. If that doesn't work, then they'll say, you don't know what you're talking about. You don't have the credentials. You're just a fool. You're ignorant. You're unlearned. Like they did with Peter. I think it was Acts chapter 4. But look what Paul says. Verse 25, but he said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. Hmm. Verse 28, Then Agrippa said unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. Why didn't Agrippa get saved? Right on the spot. Because a king has a hard time with soberness. They want to live the lavish lifestyle. They want to live um, and have good parties and, and throw big things and whatever else. Soberness? You can't do this and you can't do that and don't watch this and don't listen to that and don't this and don't... That's being sober. A lot of kings don't like that. They don't want to have to have people make fun of them. Oh, your little goody two-shoe. Oh, look at you. Little virgin ears. Oh, oh, oh. 
We need to have a call to sobriety, a call to being sober, to soberness, whatever you want to say. We need to get serious. Again, I, I've been trying to tell people this. I've been saying, you know, this whole coronavirus thing and whatever else, it is a war on freedom. Well, brother, I think we need to just continue passing out tracts and just talk about the gospel and read Bible verses and things. Well, that stuff's good. We're supposed to do that, but uh, understand they're slipping a noose around people's necks. And it gets bad. It gets to a point where, you know, you're not going to be able to preach or teach the word of God. They can lock you in your home or come and get you from your home and take you to some place to be treated and whatever else. And this, Lord only knows what they're all they're putting in this vaccine and whatever else that they're trying to come up with. You know, we need to be sober. We need to start getting serious. Don't act drunken. Don't run around like some kind of an imbecile running and jumping and doing cartwheels and screaming and whatever else and, and things. Um, you see people that are doing that, they're, they're not being sober. So, please take heed to this um, because I think it is a very, very major issue. You know, seven different things that I'm saying, a call to. And uh, like I said, next week it's going to be a call to holiness. Um, first, call to righteousness. You need to be right. Second, you need to be sober. You need to be serious, grave, temperate. Um, don't be some kind of a goofball that just all you want to ever do is just laugh and joke and just ha, 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 ha. Um, this nation's going down, okay? There's going to be a lot of bloodshed over the next few years. Huge amount of bloodshed. A lot of people are going to die. That's serious. It's a sober time. We need a call to sobriety. So that is going to be it, and we will see you in the next study. Thank you very much for watching. King James Video Ministries has been faithfully preaching and teaching from God's Word since 2008. Our YouTube channel has never been monetized and we do not accept money from the lost world because this would violate the scriptures. King James Video Ministries is supported by saved brethren in accordance with 1 Timothy chapter 5 verses 17 through 18. If you have been blessed by our videos, we would ask that you prayerfully consider supporting this ministry financially. You can donate online by visiting www.kingjamesvideoministries.com or by sending a check or money order to King James Video Ministries, P.O. Box 214, Patton, Maine, 04765. Thank you to all who donate to this ministry, and we pray for the Lord's blessing in your lives.